Well, why don't we just get right into it then? Um, let me introduce to the Life Magnetics audience, Lina K. Tier. Did I say Lina correct? Yep, you did. Okay. Lina Tier is a spiritual teacher and coach and the founder of the Mindset and Manifestation podcast, as well as the Journey of Awakening podcast. Lina experienced a personal spiritual awakening after discovering the teachings of Neville Goddard in 2019. Lynn helps individuals connect with their higher self and develop greater awareness. Welcome, Lina, to the Life Magnetics podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So the thing that drew me to you and made me invite you to the podcast is your mentioning Neville Goddard. Neville Goddard in my life is probably, uh, along with Edgar Casey, my primary spiritual teacher. I've got Feeling is the Secret right here. I've got another podcast <laughs> that I do when we're presently going through Feeling is the Secret. And he just absolutely changed my life as well. So I'm really excited to have you and I want to hear all the things. <laughs> um, why don't we start about around your spiritual awakening and how Neville played a role in that for you? Uh, well, um, first of all, I believe that on this journey, we're, we're all really kind of always going through the process of awakening, right? It should be, it's just a journey. And for some of us, we awaken sooner, you know, to greater awareness and what is out there. Um, I was actually, I had dealt with anxiety and depression for like 47 years. And I was tired of dealing with it, tired of dealing with insecurities, things like that. So I was really started with law of attraction and affirmations and things like that. And at the time, energy vibration didn't resonate, but the affirmations did. And I stumbled across a YouTube channel uh, by Joseph Ally. He mm -hmm. mentioned Neville Goddard. And I remember the I looked up Neville Goddard. The first couple of uh, lectures that I heard, um, I can't remember if I listened or I read. I think I heard a couple. And at first, his voice didn't really resonate because it was so, he's just, I mean, it's commanding. What I love his voice now. But at first it didn't resonate because it was kind of really old school kind of um, speaking after a couple, after listening to a couple and then reading a couple of his lectures, <clears throat> excuse me, something happened with that. What he was saying resonated on such a profound level. I had zero doubt, like zero doubt that what he was talking about was true what he was saying about scripture was true and i'm i have chills right now zero doubt and then after that i would say probably a couple weeks after like really kind of listening to his lectures and then really resonating i remember i woke up one night and i looked over the clock and it said 11 11 and i was like there I was like, okay, this means something I didn't know at the time. Now I see synchronous, I see numbers all the time, like synchronicities everywhere. But um, I just knew that something was happening. I had already overcome anxiety and depression. There were still things I needed to work on. And then things started getting, I would say at the time, really weird. Now nothing surprises me. I don't think anything is weird. Um, I started having visions i started having mystical dreams and um i remember that one of the first dreams i had it was so profound i was in a cave and i heard this bo loud booming voice there was a lot to it um and i shared this on you know my youtube channel and on my blog but in this loud voice i heard i am and it, like just reverberated throughout the whole cave and um, then I started having other dreams and visions that related to scripture. And then I knew, okay, something's going on here. And then things just start, started snowballing uh, from there in meditation, the past life regression. Now scripture, I read scripture and it makes so much more sense. It's like, so the symbolism just sort of unfolds itself. Um, I'm going through the book of Revelation now on my channel. And um, 
just sharing what the downloads and stuff that come through what I channel. Um, so yeah, that was, it, it happened. I found his lectures, they resonated. And then all this other stuff started happening. And now there's so many more things that resonate beyond the veil. Um, so many things I, I understand now after past life regression and things like that. Um, and then Neville, what Neville talks about, it's so much more than just manifestation. Neville was awake. And some of the experiences that he has had, it's very clear of how awake he was. Um, and so much of what he experienced was really, really mystical um, in nature. So now with the courses and stuff that I'm working on, I'm trying to dive deeper into more of his awakening experiences and break that down a little bit more so than just what he teaches on manifestation. Please remind me to come back around to some of those experiences that Neville had and if you could share that with my audience. But first, I kind of wanted to ask you, because you mentioned having anxiety and feeling insecure um, prior to your spiritual awakening and then things shifted for you. Can you speak a little bit about your uh, belief framework before your spiritual awakening and uh, how your anxiety manifested, what that felt like and how that showed up in your life? Oh my goodness. The, my first recollection, I was five years old um, of having anxiety. Um, my dad, I watched my dad walk into the house. He hit my grandfather. And I remember feeling anxious at that time. I dealt with, the, I dealt with uh, mainly like sexual abuse going up, insecurities around. I had red hair, freckles, you know, things like that. I was really closed off because from a really young age, I, I always knew there was more out there. I just knew. I always felt connected to God, who at the time I thought was an external being. But I could never talk to anybody. People thought I was weird. Right. So I shut down um, and I ended up with anxiety. Right. It just and then when you focus on the anxiety, you manifest more of it. Right. And then I honestly I think the depression came after the anxiety. Right. Because I had to shut down and then I didn't feel really comfortable being authentic. Um, and it just snowballed because, again, what we focus on grows. Right. It's what I was dealing with. So I that's what I focused on the insecurities, anxiety, depression, and it just manifested over and over and over again. I grew up in poverty. So that, um, that played a part, right? I dealt with abuse that played a part. And I felt like I was in this hole, right? That I could not dig my way out of. I was suicidal uh, many, many times growing up. And that was my mindset. Like I'm, in poverty and lack, right? Dealing with insecurities, not being able to be authentic and be my true self and really share kind of what I felt, right? What was going on be, beyond this 3D reality. I didn't know what it was at the time. I just felt there was more. Um, so that, I mean, I was that way till like my mid to late 40s. Yeah, I dealt with that. And um, again, I just got tired of it. And I, I don't even recognize that person now. Completely different. My mindset, it has done a complete 180. I'm like, how was I even ever that person? You know? So I, yeah, I have a completely different mindset now. So did you have a religious framework of some kind? Like, because I know you mentioned going through the Book of Revelations on your YouTube channel, which we're going to have to know what that YouTube, YouTube channel is, because I'm going to want to <laughs> watch that. Um, but were you a Christian or did you go to church previously? So when I was young, when I was a kid, I went to church, was baptized, all that. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, went in the military, um, didn't go to church as much. I just, you know, I had other things going on, had kids, and I just kind of set uh, church to the side. I always felt connected to God. Um, there were times where I didn't feel connected and where I kind of was questioned God, right? Eventually, I got to a point when I believed in external God, I just stopped questioning what was going on. Um, and I had, so I, 
as an adult, I got back into the church. Then I started having some experiences where I thought that I actually was experienced demons a couple of times. So then I went through the whole process of breaking generational curses and rebuking and all of that. And I was heavy into the church. Um, but at the same time, there was still something not, not quite right, like with what we were being taught, because there's a lot of judgment there. I'm like, this doesn't, this doesn't mesh with what the Bible teaches. So yeah, I went through that whole journey, right? Of being in the church and, and believing a lot of what we were taught, but things still didn't resonate. And then again, I found Neville's teachings and all of a sudden I haven't gone back. So I, so I've kind of been through like pretty much every step that I can think of, you know, as far as the church, being in the church, believing wholeheartedly in it as a kid, not going to church, going back to the church, and then, you know, believing what we're taught, it not resonating, dealing with like, phys like physical manifestations of like demons and stuff, um, having those experiences, which was really weird. But then um, I had uh, manifestations of God as well, like seeing visions and things like that and f presence. And it was just a whole bunch of different things. Right. Um, so it's been an incredible journey. So let me yeah, ask you, so I did. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I did consider myself a Christian for a while and now I still do in a sense, but I understand it has a whole different meaning behind it. So. Mm, thank you. Um, we have so much in common. I'm like, geeking out right now, but <laughs> I'm really totally geek. I just so that you know, um, I was a fundamentalist Christian for about 12 or 15 years. I was a missionary. I was sold out and radical for Jesus. I was a, I, a street preacher. Um, wow. And so I had a very personal and, and um, really actually a psychic relationship with God growing up. And then you know, as is so common with spiritual seekers, I ended up leaving the church and the organization of it. And I wandered around for a little while. And then I kind of came back to it in, in my own reasoning. So I, I definitely, definitely resonate with that. Now, out of what you just said, I do have a question for you because okay. Neville, as you know, teaches that everything is just you pushed out. And so your interactions that you would have with, for example, a demon, how would you uh, reconcile that with the concept of everything is you just pushed out? Would you say that the demons that you encountered were aspects or shadow aspects of you, or do you think they were externalized negative entities? I don't believe anything is external. Okay. Anything. Um, yeah, anything. And a lot of people could probably argue that, but that goes even to a higher aspect of even what Neville teaches, like multidimensional. Um, so the demons, I realized now that they were, it was just because when we're asleep, right, what we experience, um, we, <laughs> We experience, I believe, kind of what we're familiar with in any given moment in a way that is going to best teach us, right? So it was really um, it was just shadows. Like I was sleeping one day on the couch and I looked up and I saw this little black cherub on the back, end of, on the back of the couch because I was sleeping on the couch, the couch face in the wall and then I saw it material, dematerialize and float. And then there was a time I woke up uh, in the middle of the night, like I thought I was having a heart attack. My chest was really heavy. It was anxiety. Um, and I couldn't get up. And um, I heard this growling voice. What did I do? Oh, I started to rebuke it, like in the name of Jesus. And then this growling voice said, uh, repeated back to me. It was scary. So it wasn't a, like I didn't see it, but I could hear it and feel it. But I realize now it was all just an internal manifestation, right, um, of the darkness and stuff that I felt. And just working through it was part of what many people call shadow work. Yeah. So, again, I don't believe anything is external. And everything is a manifestation, shows up in different ways. Um, and some of what we deal with that we can't reconcile and figure out how, well, how did I manifest such evil and things like this? A lot of it 
um, and I don't want to get too deep into this. This can be esoteric for some people, but we carry through from past lives, right, to integrate in this lifetime when we awaken. So some of what is manifested was actually done so in previous lives and carried over for us to, to continue to go through the experience. Do you think that, or did Neville Goddard believe in past lives? Uh, yes. Yeah. He talks about that, that when the physical body passes, like passes away, it just reincarnates or incarnates again into a physical, you know, another physical body, younger age. Like he used the term, like, um, not, in, not an infant, not an adult, but usually like around the age of 20, any ailments you had in the past, right. You don't have those ailments. And then you continue the journey, right. To continue. Okay. I've got to, I've got to, I don't, I have not read that uh, with oh, Neville, I, but I haven't read it all. So, but let's, can you drill down into that? So what is Neville saying that you, 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 you dive of the flesh and you come back, you incarnate in the flesh, but you incarnated at a certain time, like a 20 year old, you don't come back as an infant. You don't come like you're a walk-in. Right. Yes. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. An, a soul, right. Who agrees to ha incarnate having certain experiences here not everybody's walk-ins right so i'm an for me i'm an old soul i've lived many many lifetimes um we so yeah the soul dies in the flesh but if that soul hasn't awakened right as a human in this in this body of flesh um they will continue the journey to basically play out those you know the, some the karmic cycles play out the experience until that individual awakes, right? Um, and then when the individual awakes, we go through the ascension, our, our bodies, we go through an ascension process, right? It's not what a lot of people think we go through, we rise higher and higher and turn into a light body and ascend off of the planet. It doesn't, some of that has some truth to it, right? But it really all happens internally. Um, so yeah, and then when uh, when the soul awakens and it's time for that soul to leave the physical plane, right? The soul agrees to it before incarnating here. Then at that time, the soul will leave and then who knows where a soul goes, whether it's, you know, to a different planet or just, you know, to a different dimension or whatever. Again, that can get kind of esoteric. That's a whole nother story around all of that many many stories um but yes neville believed in reincarnation i don't believe he uh he ever talked about any of his past lives um but he did believe that this because the soul never dies the soul is infinite right we're one with god we're fragments of source um so we're infinite Hot damn. I'm loving this conversation. Um, <laughs> so you're speaking of awakening and of course you've gone through an awakening and I think many people listening are in the process of this as well. Are there any evidences that would uh, validate that an awakening is taking place in the life? Any um, sort of symptom an of an awakening? Like how would an individual yes. validate it? Or how would they know that it's happening? Is there anything that does happen in the life when the spirit starts to awaken or we awaken in the dream, if you will? it's different for everybody. I believe it's different for everybody um, because we all agree to different experiences prior to coming here, right? Some people have similar experiences. Some people have different experiences. For instance, with scripture, like me, like it basically just cracking open like an egg and the symbolism just, just like spilling out now. Um, some people don't resonate with that. Some people have alien abduction. Some people don't right? Um, there are ascension symptoms, right? You can, you can look up physical ascension symptoms online. Many of those um, think are medical in nature, right? A lot of uh, awakening signs and things. Um, people try to put a scientific meaning to certain things, right? Certain uh, visions or certain mystical dreams and stuff that people may have. That don't understand them they think oh it's you know this is just a dream it has no meaning or uh this dream must have something to do with what's going on in my external reality 
there are many, 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 many things, right? Some people have a spontaneous awakening due to trauma. Some people have their awakening may still be due to trauma, but it's slower in nature, right? And it's not as profound as like a near death experience. I think when somebody begins to, oh, when an individual begins to realize that there's more out there, there's more to this world than what we are led to believe by the government, the media, like the, the systems that are put in place um, and start questioning uh, their life, existence, things like that, what's really out there. I think that's really the beginning of it. And then, um, and then understand, like getting in tune with their body um, and, and realizing, you know, some of this stuff going on doesn't make sense. There's no medical reason behind it, like ringing, like ringing in the ears. A lot of people think it's tinnitus. For me, I'm Claire Audient. I had to have, and I had the flu. I lost my hearing, thought it was physical in nature. And now I hear angelic tones and frequencies, things like that. Um, so, and just a lot of things like achiness and things like that are, are, the energies and stuff coming in off the sun, right? Our bodies are changing into our light bodies internally. So it could be anything. It really is um, different for each individual. But when an individual starts questioning reality and what we've been taught, I think that's really the beginning. And awakening the knowledge of what's really going on does not come all at once. Uh, it would be really overwhelming. There's some really incredible things, right? That you begin to experience when you, you know, as you awaken and begin the ascension process. So I think people just need to question. And somebody asked me this the other day, can you set the intention to awaken? Um, actually it was a podcast I did yesterday. And I said, we can set an intention for anything, but here's the deal. If you set an intention to awaken, you have to be prepared because if you have not done a lot of the internal work that you will awaken, if you set the intention, if you have faith and that's what you want to do, you'll experience it. Make sure you're prepared for that. Make sure you're prepared with any intention that you set and question everything. When you awaken, you have to unlearn everything that you have have learned. If you feel ill or dizzy or whatever, don't us maybe, and I, I'm not trying to give medical advice, but if, if you're listening to this podcast, you already have an awareness, right? Of awakening, ascension, things like that. Um, start to question, right? Because all of the knowledge is already within you, within your DNA. Um, and you're, and it will awaken, right? As you start to question and things like that. So um, I'll do a lot of questioning. Yeah. yeah. And don't automatically think there's an outside answer for things. Everything's in, you already know internally. That reminds me of a fantastic book by Gopi Krishna entitled Kundalini. And it's just his autobi autobiography or his biography. The one he wrote himself for himself, <laughs> but it it dis, it details his Kundalini awakening, and he was actually secular minded. He wasn't necessarily um, part of a religion or active in a religion, but he loved to meditate, and he would spend hours upon hours just meditating. And one day he activated Kundalini, and it traveled all the way up the spine, right through the crown, and his whole life changed. In fact, the book is just documenting like how hard it was for him he almost died the physical symptoms the mental insanity yeah. and all of the things that he actually felt it was it was a huge deal and he had to learn how to calm it down so it's a really good book for anybody interested in awakening and kind of how to do it in the right way you mentioned something that i thought was really interesting which is that uh the idea that trauma leads to awakening and I would like to talk a little bit more about that because it, in my experience, I've found that a lot of the most powerful healers, the most powerful exhorters, the most powerful ministers have gone through a lot in their early years and sometimes not so early years, but like a lot of abuse, a lot of um, a poverty, like you and I have that in common as well, yeah. poverty and abuse. But 
Do you think that there is a, a portal in that pain to awakening? And if so, can you comment on that? A portal? Um, so here's what I think. First of all, not everybody who has an awakening has gone through trauma. There are different types of souls, right? Um, and, and some souls never go through trauma. Like there are young children now. Um, my chiropractor, her son, he's like five. And he was like, mom, uh, I knew you were going to be my mom, right? There are souls now who don't ever go through trauma. They're just basically already at that point where they're pretty well aware that, you know, there's more to this. So there are different types of, of souls, different star seeds and stuff. So not everybody has to go through that trauma, but, and it states in the Bible, the furnaces of affliction, right? So many of us going through the trauma, it is, it's just part of the awakening uh, process. And I don't think there's, um, there's, I don't think there's any way around it for many, many people who awaken. And it's my opinion that a lot of people who do go through like a lot of that trauma and stuff, um, I believe, but, you know, I don't know 100% are old souls and have lived many lifetimes um, and, and go through that trauma. It's just part of, of the journey. But I don't think there's any way to you know, to get away from it. And not everybody who goes through trauma will have an awakening in this particular lifetime. As far as a portal goes, uh, I don't know. I don't know a lot about like, I don't know a lot about like portals and, and, and stuff like that, energetic portals and stuff. So I can't really speak on that. Yeah, I was just really referencing. Um, it creates a path forward and through like sometimes trauma can oh, yeah. create a path through and maybe even accelerate your way into the awakening. Um, yes. Because I think you go like one of two ways. You, one of the ways you can go is that you habituate to the trauma and then you perpetuate it and you struggle in your life and have a really hard time. The other way to go is to at some point become clear, hey, I need to heal this. <laughs> I need to heal myself. Yeah. I don't want to live this way. And so I'm going to undergo a process of uh, personal development, which often leads us to the spiritual development and awakening. And I think okay. trauma is, can be the impetus for that. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. So I get what you're saying. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. But again, before we even incarnate here, we agree to these experiences, right? Um, so, you know, some souls may agree that, hey, I just want to run the gamut. Let me just experience this for you know 50 60 years or whatever so i can have the full experience um but then you since we have i'm gonna say this and it's kind of controversial like in the manifesting community but we do have free will we ourselves we have free will um so while we're here although we agree to certain experiences you know maybe perhaps if the trauma is too much for an individual given the free will maybe that soul makes, you know, decides, okay, I, you know, I don't want to have this experience anymore. So let me, let me change this, you know, let me shorten the experience and, and awaken now. So I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that's very possible. Going back to something you said in the beginning about hearing Neville's voice originally and how, you know, you, you didn't really align with that. It's interesting because Neville tells the story of how I think it was one of his teachers told him, like, you, the way that you speak, you're never going to be a speaker. You're never going to be successful. Yeah. And so that was his fire to continue to to become excellent and to pursue his his dream of doing exactly that. And of course, he went on to great success. Um, and you also mentioned. Well, I, I, what I wanted to say about that was in my in my feeling about Neville, whether spoken or written, I feel like the words as he spoke them were arranged in a very magical way that they contain attunements and they contain within the words themselves activations that kind of allow you to up level into the principle that he's introducing, whatever layer of that you are. You're giving me chills again <laughs> because I believe that because any knowledge that we come across, any knowledge is already within us. And at certain points on this journey, we come across knowledge. It does. Our DNA gets activated. There's a lot of dormant DNA. People don't really, they, you know, scientists call it junk. No, it's not junk. 
right? Things are getting activated. I totally agree with that because when I really started listening to him, you're right. His words are and the way he speaks and everything is arranged in a magical way. But I believe it's, it's that way, the way he spoke was because the people that were meant to come across his teachings and awaken, right, would resonate with the way he spoke and, and the way his words were arranged because his teachings don't resonate with everybody. Correct. Now, some people say that Neville started to change um, towards the end of his life with regard to how he felt about Christ, Christianity, religion, whereas in the beginning he um, obviously quoted a lot of scripture and gave us the esoteric meanings of this, but towards the end, he kind of started to adhere more towards, um, I don't know, religious structure. Do, do you have a, an opinion on that? Or do, do you find that in your study of Neville? To religious structure. Well, just, he okay. seemed, he seemed to be, um, he seemed to shift and change a little bit from more the broad application of manifestation to a more, um, structured Christian, application what is the book is it immortal man i i have to uh, the immortal it might be yeah he's Mort got a, a i mean it's really title. it's really dense it's really dense yeah. um, with the christian thoughts which is fine i mean that's my paradigm anyway i can dig it but i'm just wondering if you think through the transit of his life he he shifted and changed in any of his beliefs maybe not he well he so there's a lot of repetitiveness in his lectures because he gave them year after year. And he's got close to 400 lectures. And some of them have the same titles year after year. Um, his teachings did change as far. And, I, and I've read that lecture. I've recorded that on my channel and on my, um, my podcast where I just read his lectures. Um, but I, can't, I don't recall it right now, uh, what it was about, honestly. Um, so as far as leaning more towards the structure, I don't know. I don't recall. But his teachings, his teachings did change. They shifted a little bit over the years. Some things he said early on, he contradicted himself a little bit later on. But it's because this is a journey, right? And our experiences change our perception and our knowledge about certain things. And, and I say all the time, um, we only truly know something by experience, right? So you may experience something one year and it becomes your truth because you've experienced something and then you have different experiences. So your truth changes based on your experiences because he was, he, um, have went through the awakening and eventually the ascension process. So when he talks about like meeting, uh, recognizing, you know, people right recognizing their souls basically that's because he was going through the ascension process himself internally um so yeah his teachings changed i don't know though that i'm gonna have to go back and read the lecture now because i don't know that he be became more um uh talk more about the or resonate more with the structure i'm, I'm uh, not i'm not sure i just i've read that as um just as an opinion you know really I, I, I don't have, know, so, but, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't I, imagine that. I well, couldn't you, imagine that. You mentioned that he contradicted himself a little bit. Can you speak to maybe some of the instances where that happened? Um. Oh, now I, sh I said that. Now I got to try to recall <laughs> it. Um, it's uh, okay. It's okay if you don't. That's, that's, yeah, I can't, you know, but I, I think, can't recall, but um, I think some of his, um, Oh, shoot. I can't recall. Honestly, That's I okay. shouldn't have even said it, but he does. I've got, uh, so again, he's got over 400 lectures. So some of the teachings changes change over the years. Um, again, I think just as he went through the awakening process. So now I'm going to have to go now. I'm going to have to go read that lecture and go look for some of the contradictions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's, that's perfectly fine. That's okay. I, I just, I wasn't aware. And so yeah. I'm just curious as to what those might be, but I totally believe and understand what you're saying. Like this is a journey. And as a spiritual teacher, and, and I do the same, I have students, um, you know, as I teach over the years, like my position changes on certain things. Like, and when I first began to teach, I was mainly focusing on intuitive gifts and like how to activate these. But like, as I continue to change and grow, like I, my focus is on, well, I'm really interested in divine concept of self. I'm really interested in I am. And you mentioned I am at the top of this conversation. And like, 
that so that sounded like that was a profound realization for you the i am principle can you speak to that and like how you how you interpret that for yourself and others so this was a oh my goodness the very beginning of my awakening i had this dream um you know in this cave a beautiful cave and um this eye appeared in the cave like a physical eye and it swallowed up all these beings which i later realized they were all aspects of myself this huge crowd right and then i heard this i am it was confirmation for me like i knew without a doubt that was confirmation of there's no separation right between myself and god and i am i i am anything that i want to be i so i am it was so profound and some dreams are really i've had a few really profound dreams like that that if I was a painter, I could literally paint the visual of it. It was just so vivid. Uh, some some dreams that are, are profound and the symbolism doesn't come right away. But this was so profound right at the beginning of my awakening. And um, so, I, I mean, I am is just, an, it's just a name of God. God has many names. Um, and God, I even believe so... This has come to me re like within the last, you know, few months or whatever, last six months. God is really just an, an, like anything, like an energetic, like a frequency, like a vibration, infinite love and infinite light. It's not a being, right? Um, it's energetic, just like everything, but created everything, manifested everything because um, God wanted to experience itself, right? Um, so I am is just basically a manifestation of, you know, infinite love, infinite light, all powerful, limitless. And also I am so, which obviously speaks to, and this is a heretical concept, you know, in, in some religions, Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity, the idea that I am. And that I come from the I am and the scripture that says, let us make God in our image. Like I believe personally, I was there. I'm the, I was in the pantheon of entities that yeah. created, created. And my yep. impulse therefore is to create. And I think a lot of people that triggers a lot of self-worth stuff inside of them. Well, how can I be that powerful? Like, how can I have the power to create a new outcome for myself when all I've known for 40 years of my life is this thing or how all I've known for 20 years is this marriage. Like, how does that happen if I'm so divine? Yeah. Um, how do people, how would you help somebody who didn't experience themselves in their own I am and in the power of that start to, or to come into the understanding of the potential of, of who it is that they truly are? Well, because we are all powerful, right? And um, because that's who we are, right? That's where we began. The I am, right? We manifested our, we manifest ourselves, manifested more, more of ourselves, right? Because every one is us pushed out. We're just fragments of each other, basically, right? Manifestation upon manifestation, um, and all connected because we're fragments of the you know, the one, um, I am source God, so, but as souls, the hardships, everything we go through, we chose to have those experiences, our souls, right. Chose to have these experiences for the, to awaken, right. And if you take, if you look at it from a different perspective and I can reflect back on it now, but as hard as everything was that I went through, now I realize it was such a beautiful experience. I chose those experiences, right? To, to come into the knowledge that I have now, to come into the realization of who I am, the, the divine being that I am. Who, that is infinite love and infinite light, right? And limitless. So no matter how hard things seem, you were powerful enough, right? To, first of all, manifest yourself into this physical body 
to have these experiences. It was your choice. You are not a victim to what you are experiencing. You chose to have these experiences so that you could awaken and come into the knowledge of who you are. And it's really, really beautiful. Um, when you, I think when you look at, when you're able to look at it that way, um, and to realize that even though you made that choice to go through all these experiences, you can change them at any time. By, and you can do it even by simply setting an intention, right? Um, and just having faith in the powerful being that you are. And I know it's a process for many to get to that point. But if you can really just feel into that, as often as possible, um, eventually it becomes natural and you just know. Um, and then, yeah, it's peaceful. It feels peaceful and beautiful. Yeah, but you made the choice to have these experiences. You can change them at any time. You're that powerful. I think that, and I've run up against people who have a real problem with the idea that they as a soul would have chosen to experience uh, being abused or being taken advantage of. There are so many people I think that are very invested in the the literal experiences of their life and how that defines them. When you pop out of 3D and go meta and you zoom out and you look, oh, as a soul though, I can see how my father, the abuser of my life, actually taught me so many profound lessons and how I can see the nature of my father emerging through me at times. And that's just contrast. It allows me, it's a reminder of me to, to get back to center, get back to divine self. Like when you zoom out and really look at why a soul might want to experience something like suffering in all of the ways that we can, like it does actually make sense, but it requires that the person take radical responsibility yeah. for where they are. And I don't think everybody's ready at this time to be responsible for the fact that the planet we live on and all of the conditions we're experiencing right now, which seems a bit crazy and insane on the planet, we're responsible because everything is just us pushed out. And if it's yeah. showing up on the screen of your life, there's a reason for that. It's the law of correspondence as within, so without. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you <laughs> no, said that it, it, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. I had, I made a comment on a YouTube video about the, the war in Russia one time. Somebody was asking about the suffering. And I was like, those souls that are suffering chose, to, chose to go through that experience, right? Um, for, for whatever reason, we have soul contracts. We have karmic contracts with other souls, the people in our lives who knows why the real reason we may never fully know right until we you know finally ascend and you know reunite with our galactic family or whatever um but do we really well some people probably say they really need to know but i'm at the point now where i'm like do we really need to have all of the answers let's just enjoy enjoy the knowledge that that we're gaining now and you know this awakening process and let it play out because it never ends. We go on and on and on as souls. Let us just try to enjoy it um, and not try to understand everything um, there is to know because we really can't. There's no way. We're never going to fully know everything. Awesome. So good. You're taking us to church today. So Let's get down to some manifestation brass tacks, because I think we probably both hear from students and people like, well, <laughs> I have got my vision board and I understand feeling is the secret. I've got to have the vibration in order to impress upon the subconscious. Like I got the knowledge of it, but it just doesn't work or it works once, but it doesn't work repeatedly. What do you say to people who have trouble manifesting? Why might that be happening and how can they correct that? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, first of all, you have to be persistent right? Um, and just know that it, it can be a process. Um, first of all, you're always manifesting, right? If you can grasp that, you're always manifesting. You consciously choose, okay, do I want to just, do I want to um, set an intent, like, do I want to set conscious intentions and be persistent? Or do I just want to try to manifest things here and there and just kind of 
you know, put basically leave things, leave things to chance and not be like, not be persistent about it. Right. So you can, I have a vision board, half the, from like two years ago, half the stuff hasn't manifested because my intention behind it was just kind of like, oh, you know, I put it up, it'll manifest or whatever. Um, but I'm not, and not, not to say none of it won't manifest, but I'm not persistent about going back to certain things that I want, I want to manifest, um, set an intention, have just know I, you know, I'm setting this intention. Um, I'm putting this out into the world. It will come to pass. And anytime I have an opposing thought, just redirect the thought. It's actually really simple, right? You set an intention, uh, your words align to that, your thoughts align to that, your feelings align to that. And if they don't, you redirect them. A lot of people think that they're focusing on a manifestation and they're subtly focusing on it not coming to pass. You have to train yourself. You have. There's no way around it. You have to train yourself until you cultivate that awareness and just realize, you know, it's gonna it, it's gonna come to pass. I don't have to worry about it, right? Just right. yeah. Well, so and I in one of um in one of Neville's lectures, order than wait. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. the idea where you order everything you want and you and you are confident that the waiter's taking your order. It's going to go back to the kitchen. The kitchen's going to prepare it. And you're not constantly checking with the waiter. Did they, are, are they cooking it the right way? You know, you're not, you're relaxing. You're sitting yeah. down at the table, having a conversation with your friends. You're having a cocktail and you're just waiting. So when you say persistence, I think that, um, that is just the noticing of when something's out of alignment with that, which you've called into creation. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that does require training be, and also the indulgence of lower moods, yeah. even though we can maybe muster the feeling of that which we want to become by feeling that we are already that if we spend 90% of our life, though, actually indulging reactive and lower vibrational feelings, then that can counteract what you've I can it. Maybe I'm wrong. Can that come? No, it act? can. And that's why, like on my podcast, I talk about culti cultivating awareness. I talk about all the time. Um, the lower mood, like lower moods, right? The opposing thoughts. Instead, like, what are they teaching you? What they're showing you something, or else you wouldn't be experiencing them. Neutralize them. Observe them don't react right and that it could take practice to not react but things keep showing up over and over and over again um as repetitive cycles or habits or whatever until we can observe and just neutralize them and look at them and go okay what is this showing me what do i need to learn from this each moment that that we observe and we can kind of neutralize something like a lower mood or something and look at it and just neutralize it not react not go down a rabbit hole but go okay what is this showing me and choose in that moment i can choose to stay in this lower mood or i can choose to just observe it realize it's there and rise to a high state of consciousness and and say okay no this doesn't resonate with me now i'm changing my story it doesn't resonate in that moment, when you take that choice or when you make that choice, you rise to a higher state of consciousness in that moment. What happens is when manifesting, as we dip into those lower moods or we doubt our manifestation, we're shifting timelines. We're on a trajectory to this timeline to my desire. And every given moment, because there are Time isn't linear, right? It's, you know, everything's happening simultaneously all at once. Many, many different timelines, infinite timelines. So every, so when you doubt, when you go into lower moods, right? If you stay in those lower moods, um, you're dipping into a different timeline, right? That, that essentially it could take long to reach your manifestation because you're no longer on the, that timeline to that desire right um so you have to be vi really vigilant kind of of your thoughts and your moods but be careful not to react right just observe what is it teaching me um 
because if you react, you're going to manifest, you're going to keep manifesting it. It's really important to neutralize, be non-judgmental, and just observe and make the right choices in any given in any given moment. Either I'm going to accept it or I'm not going to accept it because this is no longer part of my story and I don't resonate with it. That I think is the work. The work of manifestation is the training of the mind and, and, and cultivating, as you say, the awareness, the noticing and the feeling, just know, like check in, maybe set an alarm on your smartphone, check in a few times a day. How am I feeling right now? Where's the tension yeah. at? How can I loosen it? But that takes time. And Neville says, and feeling is a secret that until then, until you've got it, you sleep in prayer, you sleep in prayer, which is the domain of the subconscious, like right yeah. before you fall asleep, your last waking concept of yourself is how you're going to create when you fall asleep. And you're mentioning dreams, and you're mentioning um, manifestation. Can you speak a little bit about sleep and, and how one might want to prime themselves before? I mean, what if I had a really bad day, you know, or what if I'm actually legitimately physically ill in my life? I've had, a, I'm suffering. How can I break out of that right before I go to bed and spend some time in a different concept of self? Do you have any tools for that? Yes. I started practicing revision, but not necessarily visualizing before sleep. Um, I've done that, you know, plenty of times. It's not a regular practice for me now, only because I'm kind of at a point where I, I don't need to, like, I just don't do it. I don't, I don't feel like I need to. Um, but I started scripting, using revision and scripting. So at the end of the day, and I, I say this, but I should point out that, um, there were only like I'm there were there were only a few things like during the day where I really needed to kind of revise and change because I haven't had since finding Neville I haven't had like really horrible days in a really long long time like many years um things pop up but um I I I was like you know what I I could change this right so I brought I took out my notebook and at night I would write an entirely different story of, of how my day went it's entirely exactly like it was a fantasy novel or something like this is how my day went. Right. And I found that um, when I went back and read over that, or even in um, my regular scripting journal where I wasn't necessarily revising, but I was writing scripting like my future as it was happening now, they're like new memories. They override um, the old memories. Now, when I if I go back and look at my journals or if I think about something, things that didn't even happen are memories now as if they've happened. I would say, especially for anybody that has difficulty visualizing, um, first of all, know that no matter what happens, you can change it, okay? It, break out a journal. And write your day as though it went perfectly the day that you wanted, right? And do it before bedtime. Um, and do that until, you know, it feel like you'll start to notice you no longer have those really bad days. Um, and you'll develop new memories. Yeah, because everything is malleable. Everything is malleable. You can change anything. Oh, my God. That was juicy and great um, because I, I do find when I'm employing the pruning shears of revision, which is what Neville called it, which is a visualization technique, Like, but I'm tired, you know, and also that takes an extra special kind of skill yeah. to continue in a hypnagogic or trance state, right? And, but also be vigilant with how you're pruning it, <laughs> like in the, because you yeah. can start to dream. Especially can, without falling asleep. <laughs> that's right. I go to sleep before I'm, I'm done. So that's such a great little tip to just journal it and just be feelingly thinking about it, putting your energy into it as you do, and then drop off to sleep. I love that. Yeah. Well, I have like, I'm sorry, in deference to, I could talk to you for a very long time, I, I dare say, but in deference to time, is there uh what are the first couple of manifestations that you created that really told you, wow, this works? Um, all right. So the very first thing 
well, first of all, I started writing my list because I followed Joseph Ally's channel for a while. Uh, so I'd write like my 10 things down or whatever. Um, so manifest a couple things off of that right away, like within the first couple of weeks. But the very first thing where I was like, oh, I randomly closed my eyes and I saw a green apple, right? I don't, I wasn't even, I don't even think I put any intent behind like visualizing a green apple. I had just closed my eyes, saw a green apple. The next day I went into, this was when I was working outside the home. I went into the office and the other guy in the office had a green apple on his desk. I didn't notice it for like four hours. And I was like, oh, I just visualized a green apple. And the funny thing is I had been working in the office for like two years. He never brought in apples. He brought in a green apple and it was sitting on his desk. I was like, oh, and then I started noticing things that I didn't even write down or really think about. Like I was researching singing bowls on Amazon, right? Cause I wanted some singing bowls. I went to close it um, on my house a couple of days later at the title office. There were singing bowls on the counter or like shopping for a headboard. I go to the thrift store, found the exact headboard. I was looking forward to that. And that's why I talk about cultivating awareness a lot is because you start recognizing manifestations, whether you like wrote something down on the list or you visualized or not. You, if you called, you start seeing like manifestations everywhere. So the first was a green apple. The, and then I had a dream. It was a premonition. I didn't know it um, about a car accident. Um, and then a couple of days later, I got notified an email and the director and his wife had passed away. Well, in the dream, I saw a woman in the rain reaching up at a paramedic. Um, and that that's what happened. There was a car accident. It was raining and stuff like that. That one kind of freaked me out. It wasn't intentional. Um, so things happen in dreams for me. Um, I don't write lists anymore. Yeah. Now just, they happen every, everywhere. So whether you're, you don't even have to be an intent, intentional about it. Things manifest. Wow. It's like, you know, how Google is always listening or Facebook is always listening. Well, the universe and the subconscious is always oh, listening. Yeah. Always. Li yeah. Always listening and random stuff too. A lot of the things I wrote down, somebody asking me about, you know, a book I was writing and then some cable hey, guy came to my house and we got in conversation and he asked me about it. So yeah, just random stuff, have fun with it, you know, write your list, whatever, just randomly think about things and then try to be aware. Hmm. Thank you so much, Lena. This has been like such a great conversation. Anytime I can talk to somebody about Neville, I'm into it. I love it. Um, I've learned a lot from our conversation. Can you, I know you're a spiritual teacher and um, a coach and a mentor. And if I was looking to um, get into the mechanics of manifestation and I wanted a guide, I would definitely check you out. So for those listening who might want to learn more about you, how can they find you? I will, of course, put all the links in the description of this podcast or this Thank video, you. but like, how can they find you? Um, well, everything, my YouTube channel is just under Lena K. Tier. Um, I have a blog. So the easiest way is probably go to go to my blog. It's just Lena K. Tier, uh, dot com. And so that's the name of my site. And then my blog is actually the journey of awakening. Um, so you can go there, all the links. I have three different podcasts, my YouTube channel, Instagram. Um, I'm working on Neville Goddard, the courses. Um, so that's all available on uh, my website and what else? Yeah, that's probably the best place to, um, to go is my website. And for coaching, I do a free 30 minute discovery call. And, um, I have a couple options right now. I'm about to add monthly and any, anybody, um, that wants to work with me, I give them a free copy of, uh, it's Neville Goddard's 10 lessons. I have all of his lectures, but there I buy everybody a book and I and I send it to them, um, and it's got his ten ten of his um, original lectures. Oh, wonderful! Sounds fantastic. So I encourage everybody to go check her out at linakatier.com. It has yeah. been such a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so very much to join with for joining us here at the Life Magnetics Podcast, Lena. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day.